Well, first, Brittany, I just want to say thank you very much for your time and reaching out and the opportunity um, to share with my peers and those that also support um, our field of librarianship. And I'm always happy to talk about my experiences within this field at growing up as a library kid and also, you know, as a library leader. I'm optimistic that change is always possible. And yes. so when I think about that quote, um, it resonates with me that the universe is always working towards the good. Mm -hmm. yes. And then I have to always believe in the good um, and that as Martin Luther King often stated, we shall overcome. And that gives me peace and chaos. That gives me peace when I don't know what to do. And it gives me peace in doing well in the services that I provide in this field and throughout my career. Well, specifically as a Black woman in librarianship, I think about Dr. King and how he preaches passive resistance. But another element to that is um, he often talks about what is your weapon of love? And so I thought about like, what are my three elements of, of my three weapons of love? Like, what are those elements? And, you know, I broke it down to operating in truth and kindness, providing mm -hmm. service to all with intention and finding a way to get in the way. And, you know, that kind of aligns itself with uh, John Lewis and being good trouble and getting into good trouble. It's just a message of encouragement that I am somebody. And if I believe that I am someone, I'm going to treat others accordingly. And that lends itself into not being um, weary and well-doing as I continue to figure out ways to continue to connect the communities that I serve with the library's resources to increase literacy, community connection, and just a way to continue to be the culture keepers that we are, specifically as Black librarians. That's one of the greatest joys. I grew up a library kid. Mm. And so now to be an adult surrounded by other library kids, to be that example, uh, to be that person that go to, when you don't know what to do. I like to say people always go to the library. We're often that first stop. Where do we go? And so just seeing myself in patrons on a daily basis, I never forget what I'm here for. And I never forget um, the librarians that were there for me as well growing up. I think about this often, actually, and um, especially during the time of COVID, you know, it became very clear how necessary specifically libraries were or how very necessary we were in communities of color. Talk about a quick pivot in every aspect of our lives. Mm -hmm. And so here we are really equipped to do the work because we had always been doing it, just not on that grand scale. And the type of services that we provide often within urban communities. Now, those types of endeavors were now being done in other spaces. And so what I would like to see going forward is just more recognition for the work that we do. Black librarians are essential community keepers. Our work and our impact really just can no longer afford to be overlooked. And so what does that mean? Like, how do we get that message out? Like what we're here for? We're trained information professionals. And I'd like this work to, to be more visible, it, you know, and, and to be better understood and, and, and recognized and, and ultimately appreciated. And because we work very hard, we're very passionate and we're very committed and invested um, mm -hmm. in the day to day and keeping our services connected with those who need it most. And so in particular within the Black librarian field, I'm on the uh, executive board of the BCALA, which is the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. Um, and we discuss all the time, you know, uh, what is our key message? What are the top things we need to be working on? They're, the list never ends, but it's about just the support. Mm -hmm. we, we always need support in our communities. There's so much to be done. So I just think, you know, really getting it out there like Black librarians really do exist. And then from there, really expressing what it is that we do and how we do it so well, and how we can continue to do it and not be overlooked, undermined, underpaid, and all these other things that come along with 
um, just some of the hardships that we continue to work work against. I am often the only librarian people know, especially Black librarian. And so when I tell people what I do for a living, they're like, really? And then I start to express or, or share what our services are, uh, share what I do on the day to day. A lot of people don't know you can get an advanced degree in this field. And so those conversations lend, you know, landed <laughs> on social media. And I'm like, okay, let me formalize this. And so that's where I gave birth to Black and Booked. And I go back and forth about like how far to push it, but um, it has connected me with librarians all over the world, not just this country. I get a lot of uh, personal DMs of people interested in the field where I get to share information. But I just share my passion for librarianship it connected to uh, popular culture, uh, Mm -hmm. just sharing books that are out there uh, that many don't know about and just letting people know this, the library is your your institution and trying to teach people how to access all of our resources um, because it is the last institution really for all. And so um, I'd like to keep, keep that that hope alive that uh, one day like everybody will understand that the library is their institution. I chose that one because I feel like so what's going on right now and what's just in the world, um, you know, you, in every day on social media, you, you open your phone and you see some sort of injustice happening. And it might not be in your particular neighborhood. It might not be in your particular county or state, but somewhere someone's rights are being violated. And it's apparent to anyone who's got a camera or whoever has social media who can see it. And so, you know, I rightfully get upset for somebody in Arkansas, in Detroit, um, Atlanta, Florida, even though it's not directly affecting me, it directly affects me because it's affecting my people. And so out of all the quotes, I feel like that's the one that I think every day, if you're on social media or on Facebook or like every day I read the news, I'm up at four o'clock, I'm reading the news from everywhere. Um, kind of gives me that battery in my back to be like, this is not right. Making phone calls, you know, do whatever I have to do to put my little bit forward to say, I don't agree with what's going on. Like, I think Sean King today on his news thread, I don't know if you follow him, but there's a young man who was being tased. Like he was in a car accident and um, he flagged down the police to help. Yeah. Every day there's something. Mm -hmm. There's something every day somewhere, whether it's, I mean, it's not always police brutality where it's like, I think the young man um, who worked in a tire store, tire shop, and he went to go give the car a test drive and the owner saw the black guy getting into the car and shot the car up and killed the young man. So, I mean, it's not just police brutality. It's just a lot of just random acts of violence towards black and brown people. See, this part gets kind of tricky, right? Because like, I feel... So there's two folds to that, right? Um, There is the MLK that we see on the poster hanging in in most Black, older folks' homes as the face of the civil rights movement. But behind him were so many women who were able to elevate him to be the poster child for the movement, right? So people like Ms. Nash, Ms. Height, Ms. Baker, people who you don't really talk about because even within the, the party of elevation of black people they were still misogynists i'm the man thank you for getting me here but i'll take it from here when it's time to take the pictures right so while i'm appreciative very much so of what the civil rights movement movement um accomplished with the face of mlk i think the unsung heroes really are black women and we continue as black women to bear the brunt and carry the movement ourselves right even i think even if you go back to slavery like 
the men will hide behind the women. The women will be like, no, 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 he didn't mean it. No, 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 don't, don't take my husband. No, 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 don't, don't take my son. And I think it transcends and translates further when you start looking in the 50s into the 60s um, with the civil rights movement. And so while I can appreciate MLK for what he's done for the movement, um, I would say like, like as an impact on my life as a woman, it makes me have to fight even harder. We always hear the story about Miss Rosa Parks, right? Hmm. And um, my sister was friends with her. Um, wow. My little sister. So, you know, they. my sister's a writer um, from Pennsylvania. And so she spent a lot of time with Rosa Parks. And I think the narrative that we're always told as little kids is that like, Rosa Parks was just so tired from working that day that she just did not want to give up her seat for the white man or white woman, right? That wasn't this true story. Like she was a lifelong um, activist. Like that was planned. It was completely, it was completely planned. But when you let other people tell the story to justify other actions, women's history, our place in it, our, our, our grassroots, our, um, the way that we think differently and we're more methodical than sometimes other people or men, um, we're able to compartmentalize, we're able to multitask differently. They water it down to, well, she was just tired and she didn't want to get up. Mm. And we ran, people ran with it, right? And so, you know, I just wish there was more of that conversation that was being held versus just yeah. revving this and revving that. Yeah, but behind Reverend and Reverend that was people who, you know, the civil rights movement came out of church groups that were ran by women. I live in a town where my mayor's black, my council is black, administration is black, superintendent of schools are black. Like we are a black brand city, mm-hmm. right? Um, and what I've learned along the way, especially running for office, is that um like skin folk and always kin folk. And, you know, in terms of my own nuclear community, um, I would like to see that since we have an opportunity to have quote unquote black excellence, that people live up to that role and not just take pictures and not just, you know, be there for the spotlight, but actually put in the work to continue to allow other black people to afford the same opportunities by merit, not by association. I don't know. Like, I would love to say in five years, we're going to be X, but until we figure out how to work better together, I think it's always going to be like this. You know what I mean? Who can because get to the top first or yeah. I mean, not even get to the top first, but it's like you take two steps forward, you take a half a step or a step back because there's always, like you said, there's either crab in a barrel mentality or there's like a lack of trust because of whatever. Um other communities, they figured it out, right? They figure out like, hey, we're gonna uh, stick together. We're going to, you know, one thing about certain communities, like they're going to shop in their own stores. They're going to shop, go to their restaurants. We don't have that same loyalty, right? And I was having a conversation, sorry. I was having a conversation with somebody and like, you know, what what understanding, like, I don't, I don't come from the South, right? So I don't have that sort of like Southern sort of like um, racial stigma attached to my upbringing. My people are from Alabama, but I never was raised there. So I can't really testify to that. And while I, while looking through history books and, you know, understanding a little bit, you could see, wow, like there were some really messed up situations with the white only signs and the white only faucets and being called the N word and dogs and hoses. Like that's totally messed up. Right. But within that same system, we had better schools. We had better communities. We had our own stuff. We had our own banks. We had our own communities. And I feel like the need to assimilate so bad because of the divide of race, it ultimately led to our ultimate downfall in terms of like where we are in a, in a sense, not completely, but in a sense. Because yes, through, through segregation, I mean, when they desegregated 
we were able to then, you know, branch out into other places that we were never able to, you know, achieve or go or schools or whatever. However, with that being said, it's like, I wish that with segregation, there was better planning to keep intact what we had already established and then utilize them for what we needed, but and just brought it back to us versus being like, okay, now we're, we're, we're gone. We're out. We're here. We're there. We're where and I want to shop at this store. I want to eat here. I want to be with these people. I want to be with these people. I want to, and I feel like that ultimately, you know, kind of like made it to where we aren't further along as a people as we could have been if the same leaders that are preaching like inclusion also preached like pro black. You see the downfall in a lot of the communities. You see the breakdown of the of family unions. You see the breakdown of um, our lifestyle change. Um, and, you know, of course, there's so many other reasons why that has happened. So it's not just that. There's systemic racism. There's, there's you know, there's so many other reasons beyond just that part of it. But I feel like part of me is like, if we could just go back and maybe just change this a little bit, before they hit the okay button, then maybe, just maybe, um, we'd be a little bit further along. So in, the fi in five years, we would own X instead of just trying to rent X. Mm. Or, you know what I mean? Like, and it's, and it's not like we haven't been bred to be that way, right? It's not because through history, we've been conditioned to think a certain way so I get that as well 100% um so like I said it's hard to 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 think back but it's just in hindsight mm -hmm. you know the yeah. 2020 view um I mean I'm, I'm very happy and I'm hopeful because I you know with the gift and the curse of social media if you've never gone anywhere outside of your neighborhood or your state you're able to live vicariously through other people's lives with the internet now right and I grew up, I'm 43 years old. So I grew up without the internet. Internet came when I was like 18, <laughs> right? Somewhere yeah. around there. Yeah. I had dial up with AOL. Yeah. Net zero. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm from that era, right? And so with that being said, it's like you're able now to see that like, if you're in a certain living condition, that's not what it is for everybody. Like there are people that look like you who have a different lifestyle and it gives you a, a focal point. Like, you know what? I'm getting up out of here. I want to be like tiger shot four, four, one on Instagram. Like mm -hmm. they're living life. Like they're traveling, they're X and they're Ying, And, you know, so, you know, I, I think that in five years, I'm hopeful that more people are able to live outside of their current situations. If it's not so pleasant, and I also hope that people who are in a position to reach back down to help out, help out. And don't just say, well, I'm out. <laughs> like, <laughs> I did it. You can do it too, because it's not that easy. Freedom is never voluntarily granted by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Oftentimes when you are engulfed in privilege or you don't understand what bias means or what prejudice means or even what racism means, you don't, you're not aware of other people's experiences until they bring it to your attention for you to do something about it. So you have to be able to advocate for yourself and others. I'm really, that's like one of my tenants in life. <laughs> so it really spoke to who I am as a person and who I would love for, you know, people around for me, around me to be as well as advocates and um, social justice warriors, as people like to call us. <laughs> that was a great question. So MLK's life has impacted me as a Black woman tremendously. Mm -hmm. My family before me did not have their full rights mm -hmm. and could, you know, could legally be discriminated against. And because of the work that he has done, I have benefited benefited greatly to have my full rights as an American citizen. So due to the legislation that was passed during his time, 
and during you know for the people that were a part of the civil rights movement is very important and as a result i will continue to advocate and fight for those of us in america that have been marginalized and discriminated against oh i have a long list so uh, <laughs> Weird. That's what we're here for. Get ready. All right. <laughs> so first, I would like uh, for people that have been previously incarcerated to be given the right to vote, get financial aid, government assistance, etc. This country was started on the premise of no taxation without representation. So how can we tax formerly incarcerated people when they can't give their input in the communities that they are a part of when they come out? Also, we need health and environmental justice and equity. All the things that MLK spoke about in his speeches still are applicable today. So we still need to advocate for the right for fairness in housing, education, and healthcare in our healthcare system. And especially with our healthcare system, me having a background in health sciences as a librarian definitely speaks to, you know, our infant mortality and um, maternal mortality rates within the Black community. That is something that needs to be addressed and we need to wake up and be there and listen to um, people that give birth and be there for them during the duration of that time. So, you know, like as someone says, from the womb to the tomb, <laughs> we need to be concerned about people all the way throughout their life. And I wish we would embrace more kindness and caring and love around um, each other and really embrace each other as being a part of a community. There's so there's so much we can do. And one thing that I learned during the beginning of um, the COVID-19 pandemic is to whatever you're passionate about, whatever your lane is, stay there. You know, with me, it's librarianship, health equity, you know, social justice. That's my lane. And what can I do? What am I good at? I'm good at writing. So if you need to write your legislators, do that. If you need to, you know, use social media in a way to get their attention because something is happening in your community, do that. This is, you know, social media does get a bad rap for things that it engages in. However, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement was started because of social media and because people have a voice that didn't have a voice before to document injustice, please, you know, use that, use that to your advantage and just whatever you're passionate about, whatever your lane is, stay in that and do what you can. If that's retweeting someone's GoFundMe account, if that's, you know, um, being able to be there for your neighbor that needs to get groceries because they don't have a vehicle, whatever way that is, there's, you can do that. And there's so many, so many ways, so many issues, as I stated, <laughs> that you can choose from that we need um, to do better in. Hello, my name is Janice Washington. I am an instructional technology specialist at the Cab County School District, which is in the Atlanta area. The Martin Luther King quote that resonates with me the most is freedom is never voluntary granted by the oppressor, but it must be demanded by the oppressed. We should always fight for our freedom. And it's never just only about a black and white thing. People can be oppressed in many different situations. You can be oppressed by a spouse or oppressed by your job because they don't want to see you elevate and do better. But it is on us to ensure that we demand that freedom, that we demand the access to certain things that we didn't always have access to. Whenever I think about Martin Luther King, I think about the way he persevered, how he kept pushing for change. He did not give up. He stayed the course as it pertains to his purpose. And that is the part that has impacted me the most. It's to constantly keep pushing, don't give up, continue to persevere because eventually those changes will come. And so it's very important to ensure that I stay the course, I stay in line with my purpose and I don't give up. The changes I would like to see in my community for the people of color would be for us to really just come together. Too often are we against one another, too often are we attacking one another, and it's very important for us to come together in order for change to take place, in order for us to just make a difference in this world it is very important for people of color to come together. 
We should not be against each other. We need to come together and really build something great within our community. It's been an honor to um, be a part of the InfoBase team and family and to partner with InfoBase. We've been working to together to deliver some great community um, around multiple thought leader spaces now for, oh my goodness, it's been several years, almost a couple of years now. Um, truly been an honor to do that. Um, I do a lot of professional consulting, coaching, training, um, uh, host a podcast called Get Uncomfortable, little shameless plug, um, have spent years working in the, the higher education space, um, mostly in the areas of student success, retention, advising, um, do a lot of work right now, work full time at the University of Kentucky in Lexington. Anytime a student is successful, it's all about them. Anytime they struggle, it's all about us. So it's trying to create systems that remove the cobwebs that sometimes engulf our students without them knowing it um, and ensure many, many more of them are successful. So that's really been my calling in practice over my career, whether it's been in nonprofit spaces, K-12s, um, working, spent some time working for government and elected officials, but it's all really centered around um, that ministry of washing feet and tipping a few tables once in a while. I think over time, people have gentrified Dr. King. You know, I live in Kentucky. People are now gentrifying Muhammad Ali, right? There's a whole yeah. airport named after somebody who was one of the most despised Americans when, when he took a stand. It's a, it always ends up when somebody's proven right. Um, that everybody acts like, oh, we loved him the whole time, right? Um, but it's interesting how people co-opt King quotes to use his words against whether it's Colin Kaepernick taking a peaceful knee and expressing his First Amendment rights um, to, to fight against police brutality and, and, and anti-Blackness and racism, or it's the Black Lives Matter movement saying, hey, I matter. Um, you know, I shouldn't, my kids shouldn't have to get a story every day about how to navigate policing in this country. Um, people don't know the true king, right? Yeah. Where he and Malcolm X were very, very similar in their views and their values about poor people of all races. Um, and about, you know, uh, there was a point where people were during the uprising, grow up and I grew up in Minneapolis, the uprising in the Twin Cities where people were evoking Dr. King and peacefully marching. And if you have not stood on the crest of the Edmund Pettus Bridge in, um, in Alabama, like I have, you can't imagine the bravery that was there. Mm. But it wasn't like peaceful protest was met with peaceful action. It was met with horses and billy clubs and a country that felt like he was a communist, where he had people all around the world giving him the Nobel Peace Prize, but the country he lived in not valuing and appreciating his silent protest and thinking you're bringing too much to our attention. Again, just shut up and dribble, right? Mm -hmm. So it's interesting when Dr. King quotes are used during the uprisings in the Twin Cities or around the country and people miss the King quote that says, you know, a um, riot is the language of the unheard. And I've had people ask me, so I'm not really answering your question, but I've had people ask me, why destroy your own community? Why tear things up? Why? First off, most of the time, most of the time, when buildings are burned and things fall apart in the middle of an uprising, it's been seen that the counter intel pro is happening, the umbrella man in the Twin Cities, right? Or what happened in Atlanta, the person that burned the, um, oh boy, the Wendy station. It wasn't a person who was one of the protesters, it was someone coming in to cause trouble. Oftentimes that person is a part of a white supremacist group. But when people have asked me, why would you do that? I said, how many times, I mean, I'm a Minnesota Vikings fan and I've thrown the remote and broke it for a football game. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when you feel powerless, you rage against the thing that's the closest to you. We all do that. We all do things, say things, break things, hurt things that are the closest to us because we feel unheard, we feel powerless. 
And so Dr. King, when people were asking him about why are people having riots? Why are people doing that? His quote was, a riot is the language of the unheard. So it isn't about the person doing the uprising. It's about why are we not hearing people, right? Why are they feeling so powerless that they kick a wall, they put their hand through a, a, a wall, they break a toy that they love, they damage or throw their cell phone because they're just so enraged and feeling so powerless. And Dr. King helped summarize that for us with that great quote. I think one of the other ones that you put on there is that freedom is never voluntarily granted by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. That's the most American thing you could ever do, right? Baldwin talks about, I reserve the right to love America enough to criticize her, right? Dr. King is basically saying, the oppressor isn't going to grant freedom, right? Unless the oppressed rise up right? and, and make it difficult. People forget that the bus boycotts in Selma were, the Montgomery bus boycotts were over a year 380 plus days, people didn't ride the bus, right? Mm -hmm. People stood on bridges and risked their lives. And now the entire world has kind of co-opted Martin Luther King as this quiet leader. All he said is, let's all get along, free at last, free at last. No, he said things like, a riot is the language of the unheard and freedom is never granted by the oppressor without, right? being demanded by the oppressed. And the truth is, someone asked me one day about, you know, pushing back or, you know, I, I studied to be a pastor, so I'm a table tip and foot washer, just like, you know, my hero was as a human and is as a God. And I think people forget that and forget that there's a price. He paid the ultimate price as did Dr. King and so many others for speaking up, rising up, speaking, being the oppressed that are gonna demand freedom, not for just for yourself, but for others. But we have a whole country that's founded on rioting. The, the American Revolution was a riot. It was fighting the power against the then government, British rule. There were laws being broken, but as long as we celebrate them and forget that that was oppressed, people, the colonists, feeling oppressed by British rule, they demanded change. The difference is now we've co-opted that and Dr. King, and we don't really truly understand the historical nature of what happened. So I think that is one of the most telling quotes to me. Um, and how he also talks about um, that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. I think oftentimes we look at ourselves, we kind of have this trauma Olympics and say, well, our struggle as black folks is harder than queer folks, is harder than indigenous folks, is harder. No, we all got enough trauma to go along and we all need to be standing against injustice. There's a great story from Maya Angelou, and I know you didn't ask me this, Brittany, but Again, pastoral theology degree. So I'm a Please you. go ahead. Yeah. There's a story, there's a story where Maya Angelou, uh, her and Oprah, you know, she's Oprah Winfrey's mentor, and her and Oprah are on a sh on the Oprah Winfrey show, and they're talking like mentor mentee. And Oprah is talking about this dinner party at Angelou's house, and. Um, Oprah says, you know, remember that dinner party? And Maya says, yeah, you know, we were there. And then Oprah does an Oprah thing, looks in the screen and says, you imagine who's at a dinner party at Maya Angelou's house? And I'm thinking, well, yeah, you, Oprah, I mean, that's, you know, some bad folks. But you imagine who's in the room at Maya Angelou's house, leaders in corporate, leaders in political, leaders in entertainment, leaders in justice, leaders in the literary world and the arts. I mean, all of these people that Maya Angelou would let in her space. And Oprah recounts that there's this point where they have a person at this dinner party who's telling a joke that's kind of off color, kind of distasteful, nothing crazy, but just kind of not, not cool. And Oprah recounts that the person goes to one group and they tell the joke and everybody kind of, <laughs> and then they move to another group and tell the joke. And then Oprah says, and then at some point, and she's saying this to Maya, at some point, 
we hear you from across the room and you say, I don't know if it was sir, madam, but get your coat. Please get your coat. And the person, of course, it's my hands to tell you to get your coat, but it is a giant in everything, whoever this person is, and Oprah looks at the screen and says, well, what would you do if Maya Angelou told you to get your coat? I'm going to go get my coat, right? So they got their coat and left. And Oprah talked about, said to Maya, what, we're all running companies and leaders and all of these things, but it also applies to anyone. We all sat there and just kind of laughed it off and didn't really say anything, even though we knew. What made you say something, she says to Maya. And Maya says, first off, honey, you ain't got all those muscles yet, right? So she said, I don't, that's my space. And like smoke at a nightclub, I don't let any negativity seep in my space because it, it gets in my hair and in my clothes and in my walls. And that is my space. So I'm not going to let those things in my space because then it permeates me, she says. And then she says, when Oprah says, but none of us said anything. And like I said, she said, you don't have those muscles yet. It has, she said, that comes one spoken out, speak out action at a time where you see that justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, that every time you see something that's unjust, it's an opportunity to build those Maya muscles and to get stronger so that when big injustice happens, right? When January 6th happens, when people start taking away people's rights to vote, when people start saying, oh, women don't have a right to make the decisions on their own bodies, you are strong enough to stand in those moments. But it is made up of those small moments when you build the Maya muscles so you have the capacity to deal with the big injustices, right? Um, so those are the quotes that resonate the most to me from Dr. King. I mean, everything. I'm me as a person, me as a husband, me as a father, me as a grandfather, right? Um, I there are things we are required to do. There's there is our vocation and our job. And then there is our work. And Dr. King and so many others, right, have helped embody the commitment to the ministry of the work. And the work is the stance against injustice for anyone, everyone, all the time. Dr. King died in Memphis when he was called there to organize and empower some some garbage sanitation workers. It wasn't about race, it was about poverty, right? That's what oftentimes gets lost in our nation is that we, we forget to get shoulder and shoulder with each other. You know, a small group of people get us to fight amongst each other, worried about somebody's gonna take, somebody's gonna take my cookies. But together we only got three, right? but you over here with all the cookies, right? So getting people to not recognize that we have all these things in common, let's work through all the things rather than sweeping them under the rug and elevating an image of a person that can't possibly be real and whitewashing his image and his legacy, but embracing the true Dr. King and the true man, Martin, who was a human being but who walked more in a space that Christ would have that's about tipping tables, washing feet, speaking truth to power, and not just going along. Taking nonviolent action, which caused violent responses, is the critical way to express change in this country. So for me, it has empowered and validated my work. It's also um, held me accountable to, you know, I, I remember I had a situation at an employer, which often happens for people of color and injustice is happening. And, um, you know, I'm not going to speak up, speak out. And at one point, a colleague, a mentor of mine, Renita Hervey, Rockford, Illinois, said to me, what are they going to do, lynch you? 
I mean, and that was the reality. What's the worst that's going to happen to me? I'm not going to have a job. Someone's not going to like me or I'm going to be uncomfortable. We have to fight through uncomfort and discomfort to create communities. And some of it is being forced to have those uncomfortable conversations grounded in radical candor and love with friends, families, colleagues, with ourselves, so that those uncomfortable conversations can become comfortable. And that's how we move forward. Because to be honest, folks, powers, palities in this country, this world are using the same playbook on the grandchildren of the folks that stood against Dr. King on people today. And it's working because we have not embraced going beyond right? Kind of the visible signs and fighting through being uncomfortable to really gut some of these things from our society and from, from our world and from people's hearts. I'm thinking about when, you know, th there's, there's a reason why folks are attacking things and calling them the woke culture. Now, just so everybody knows, so Brittany, you, you keep this on wax. Being woke is, again, a term that the Black community has used for generations. It's when you go into certain neighborhoods, when you go down a road, when you deal with a certain person, I say to you, stay woke, stay aware, stay awake. What you see may not be real. Right. So it's a term that the black community for generations have used to alert each other that that might be a wolf in chief's closing or that might be this situation grow that, you know, protect yourself and your family around this situation or this person. So to label it as something different is another gentrification. And, you know, a co-opting of culture, because to be woke is to be aware. And I, I think that's what we all want to be, is aware of our surroundings, aware of the world, aware of the realities of things, aware of our history. And so I think those are those pieces is that people will wake up, right? Um, I think it's the end of Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing. They just scream, wake up in the screen, you know? People are working full time. I used to learn that um, that's the time I face the most distractions when I sit in church. You know, when I'm at the ball game, I'm not distracted. I'm not thinking about hateful things. That means we're pretty close to getting it right. But we all got to do our work. And it starts with us. And it's acknowledging history. I don't mean we're coming up on February. I'm not talking about Black history. I'm talking about American history. When folks start trying to suppress the vote in this country of brown folks, they might not know the history of this country. Black folks have faced, the only reason we are here, indigenous people are here, Hmong people are here, is we face genocide. You really think not giving us water uh, around voting is going to stop us? If anything that's gonna do in Brittany, the millennial, is wake up stuff in her DNA that her sisters before her bore, and it all starts with black women. And so to know the history of this country and to sit with it and deal with it, the painful parts, rather than glorifying and dealing with some of kind of that nationalistic view, going to those info bay shout out, going to, for those, to those original sources and learning that history and then making repair. There, there's, there's nothing wrong with that, but being blind to it ensures that our world is the same world that my grandchildren will live in. And I don't think there's any parent or grandparent or auntie that wants their children or the people they love to have the same life they had. And the only way we can guarantee that is doing our own work and being brave enough to say, okay, I may have a blind spot here. I may be struggling here. This may be hard to talk about or work through, but the idea that we don't talk about certain things at the family dinner table, race, politics, and religion, 
and we don't talk about certain things in mixed company, that has created a society where talking about uncomfortable things feels like an assault on someone rather than the radical candor and coaching that really is grounded in care and love. Just like Maya Angelou said to Oprah, um, old heads, right? Older folks who have more Maya muscles than younger people, maybe, maybe, and maybe don't. We also need to let people walk their own walk, mm -hmm. right? And not expect that everyone has the capacity to fight all things all the time. Everybody doesn't have the capacity to truly embrace the struggles in uh, our political system. I was talking to a friend of mine and he said, so um, what, what is, I said, you know that just the electoral college by itself is a racist system that is designed to, it's not democratic. Every vote needs to count. Right. But in a state like Kentucky, if you vote blue, your vote doesn't matter because it's all about what the state votes. So but for a lot of people, those kind of conversations are overwhelming because it's just so where does it end and people feel powerless. So what I try to do with people is start with you. Right. Unpacking your biases, unpacking your blind spots, unpacking your opportunities to stand up, speak up, speak out. And that starts with reading and thinking and listening to podcasts. But don't read what book X tells you about Dr. King. Pull up Dr. King's works and speeches on some first sources that are really the true Dr. King. There's a great interview, I think it's in 1968, that Dr. King does with, I think it's with CBS. It's on YouTube. And he's one. sitting in a church with behind him. And when you listen to the whole interview, it that is Dr. King. That interview is Dr. King. Listening to the front to the back of that interview, which is about 20 minutes, um, he is breaking it down and breaking America down. And then think about, Brittany, I'm sure you did this, watching that interview and thinking it's not 1968, it's 2023. Because everything he's talking about is applicable today. Listen to Dr. King, the real Dr. King. Read Dr. King, the real Dr. King. Don't do the co-op whitewashed coloring book version that just wanted everybody to hold hands and love each other. That, that, that is not what Dr. King said or meant. He wanted restorative justice. You can't be a theologian and not, his name is Martin Luther King. Well, he's named Martin Luther, the great reformer, that was all about justification by grace through faith. And that's always been Dr. King's message, that it has to be some law and some gospel. And people have kind of co-opted it to fit their narrative that isn't anything accurate on who Dr. King really was or what he really said or stood for. Otherwise, if he was such a pacifist, he wouldn't have gotten murdered.